So a couple of weeks ago, as uh, you all know, um, uh, myself and five other folks, we all went to the Olympic coast. We had a very nice hike uh, out there. We went from uh, Third Beach to Toliak and then back. Uh, a marvelous, marvelous uh, hike. Um, you know, it's only six miles in and six miles out. We got some nice blisters. That was important. Um, there's a lot of planning when you're going on an overnight hike. You have to take your backpack, and you've got to take your, your sleeping bag. You have to take your tents, your sleeping pads, you know, it's a little bit of food. Bear cans. Uh, there are no bears on the coast, at least not that I saw, but there's lots of squirrels, and they like to get into your food and chew your packs apart. So we have to do all of this. One of the great considerations that you have to take care of, though, is you have to make sure that you have water. And uh, you don't want to carry in pounds and pounds and gallons and gallons of water. So therefore, you want to take in a water filtration system. You want to take something where you can make sure that your water is clean. Now, for a lot of people who, if they didn't read the, you know, the warnings online, uh, they would like to think, well, we'll go out into nature and we'll, we'll go ahead and get all the water that we want to. Not from the ocean, obviously, because that's, that's salty, but there's all kinds of little streams which come out of the woods and then go down into the ocean. And many people have this um, fantasy that all things natural are good, all things natural are healthy. Uh, I like to remind people that arsenic and rattlesnake poison, both are natural items, both are things which are found in nature, and both will have an adverse effect upon your health. Correct? All right. So there's a lot of people who think they can go out there into the woods, could go ahead and scoop up the crystal water and then drink it right down. Well, there's a problem with that. Especially on the Olympic coast, if you go to the, the Olympic coast, there's lots of animals. Lots of animals like to go to that nice fresh water as well. And animals do what animals do, okay? And animals do. And when they do that, it gets into the water. And what happens is you end up getting parasites. You get giardia. And so you, what you have is what you have, what looks like a natural stream. It looks clean. It looks okay. But the reality is that it is infected by parasites, okay? And there's nothing that you want. I, I, it is one of the worst things that could happen to you is that when you are on the trail and you're quite a ways away from civilization, where all of a sudden you have a gastrointestinal event, okay? In no way do you want to be loose as a goose when you have a whole day to walk, do you? You don't. You don't want that. Okay. I was talking to some REI guys. He, 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 they called them accidents of hygiene. Accidents of hygiene. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a nice way of saying, <coughs> yeah. Anyway. Yeah, and so you don't want that. You want to make sure that the, the water which you're taking is pure. So you take, uh, and there's multiple different types of, of purification systems, but they all work pretty much in the same way. And the dirty water is collected in some sort of canister, some sort of bag, something, and it's brought into a compression chamber. And so you take the dirty water, you put it into a compression chamber, and then you add a little bit more pressure to it. And what that does is it forces the water to go through some sort of filter, okay? Uh, it could be a Sawyer straw, it could be a cat dine filter, it could be whatever it is, and it goes through the filter, and the water goes through it, leaving the parasites behind, comes out the tube on the other side, or the spout on the other side, and you have clean, drinkable water. Marvelous. It's, a, it's an amazing type of thing, this incredible technology, okay? The only thing you have to be careful about is not to splash the dirty water onto the clean water, and you're, you're good, you're clean. Now, I bring this all up, and I talk about filtration, and I've talked about that, for the simple reason, is that people oftentimes are deceived. People are oftentimes deceived thinking that what they're drinking is perfectly fine because they don't see the parasites. They think it's clean, they think it's all right. And the reality is, is that they are in danger. And when they're, they're in danger because they are, they're taking things at face value, when the reality is that it must go through a filter. As we come to the book of Jude, we're gonna look at the book of Jude over two Sundays, okay? So we start this morning. We we'll look at the first 13 verses of the book of Jude, okay? So Jude 1 through 13, we'll look through those, those verses here. And as we do so, what we'll see is that Jude is very, very concerned for his audience because his audience, unfortunately, has allowed unfiltered teaching to come within their mix and has polluted them as a people. And he, needs, he is warning them, hey, you've got to take care of business here. Folks, I think that the warning which Jude gives to his audience is very, very apt for our time as well. For we are called to be a people who filter the things which we hear and say, is this good? Is this bad? Is there corruption there? Is there cleanliness here? So let us come to the book of Jude. We'll look at verses, again, 1 through 13. 
And uh, we have some of the, just the preliminaries as we come to the first few verses. There's introduction type of stuff, and I'll be brief on that uh, because the heart of the message really starts in verse 13, but I do want to touch the first part. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, beloved, in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. And so what we have here is we have Jude. Now, we believe that Jude here... It's a little surprising to us that uh, Jude doesn't give uh, the credit that you would think he'd give. You, Jude, we believe, is the half-brother of Jesus Christ. And you would think he might drop that little title there, how I am Jude, the half-brother of Jesus, but he does not. And I think that is a matter of humility. Instead, what he does is he links himself, rather, with James. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ, obviously, and brother of James. And we believe that this James here is not James, the brother of John, the apostle, but we believe that this is James, who is the elder, or one of the the significant elders of the church in Jerusalem. So we have uh, Jude identifying himself. Remember, I always think it's interesting, too, that, remember, if you go to John chapter 7, that Jesus' brothers do not believe in Jesus. They are not trusting Jesus. It's really not until after the resurrection where Jesus' brothers come on board. But then afterwards, of course, we have Jude and James, who, who both do. He is writing to this church, and, he, and what Jude likes to do more than any other writer I've come across he, is he likes to speak in triads. A triad is a series of three, Okay. And so we see it over and over and over again, all right? Look at verse 2. To those who are called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ, okay? So he's going to give you the very first triad right there. And he's going to say, listen, this, this is who you, who you are. You are people. You are Christians. You are the church. You are called. That is, God has efficaciously, that is, he has effectively called out your name and said, come unto me. He has called you. You are those who are beloved of God the Father. By the way, the way that we become beloved by God is not by our doing, but because God has mercy and kindness towards us. It is a matter of grace. And then we are said to be, have, be kept, or we are guarded for Jesus Christ. Okay? So what we see here is we see the beginning of salvation and the end of salvation. We see all of that all together. Still in verse 2, he continues and asks a blessing. May Second triad, by the way. Mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you, okay? And we see here these Christian virtues, the idea of mercy, the idea of peace, and the idea of love. He says, may this happen. But he says this, and he's very quick, and he says, he he changes gears very quickly because what he wants to do is he wants to get to the point of warning. He wants to get to the point and the problem of parasites within the church. And in verse 3, he's going to open up this... uh, not this debate, but this warning, okay, uh, against those who have wormed themselves inside. Verse 3, Beloved, although I was eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. What he is saying here is saying, listen, he says, I wanted to talk about some of the real big positive stuff, okay? As a matter of fact, as we go to the end of the book, there's this beautiful doxology. We'll look at it next week. But as we come to this section here, he is saying, this is what I need you to understand. I need you to be a people, and I need you to be a people who are contending for the faith. That is the content of the faith about Jesus Christ. I need you to contend for it. Now, the word contend here is the word from which we get the word agonize, okay? I want you to agonize for it. I want you to go through the hard work which is necessary. I want you to put it through the pressure chamber, if you will, to make sure that the gospel is pure. I don't want you to go ahead and to be mixed up. I want you to make sure that you have it correct. I want you to apply the filter. Beloved, although I was eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith. It has been once and for all delivered to you. It's been given to you. It's in the format which you need. You need to hold on to it. Because here's the problem. The parasites have come. Verse 4. For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designed for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and to deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. He says, listen, you've got people who have snuck their way in. They have crept in. You didn't see them, but here they are, and they have made their way into, um, into this situation. They are wicked influencers. 
Certain people have crept in unnoticed who, and again, a triad, a a three-way description, who long ago were designated for condemnation, ungodly people, and people who perverted the grace of our God into sensuality and denying our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. What does this mean that we have these people who are designated from long ago for condemnation? Okay. You know, I think of, I think of Judas, for example. Here's Judas who is with Jesus Christ for up to three years. And he's with Jesus. He hears, sees the miracles of Jesus. He hears the teaching of Jesus. And he's with him for all of this time. And yet, Jesus knows, and we know this all the way from John chapter 6. Jesus knows that even at that time, that there will be one who will betray him. And he's speaking of Judas. And, and, and we know that at some point you've, I mean, Judas is, is a man who, his path in one sense is, is predestined, but at the same time, he's also making that free choice to, to betray Jesus. He is a tragic, awful figure. Um, he's a frightful pig, figure. But we should not be surprised that we have other Judases in around us. We have some people who are designated for their condemnation, people who are not going to live godly lives Religious carpetbaggers, if you will. People who are trying to profit off of religiosity. We have also the second point. He says that they are ungodly people. That is, people who are not willing to follow God's way. And thirdly, he gives the third one, he gives it much more detail. Those who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. These are religious leaders, people teaching, people preaching, people saying this is, this is what should happen. People whose defective theology are leading to immoral practices. They are denying Christ by their actions. They are misunderstanding the grace of God. You know, it is very popular in today's world to teach that Jesus doesn't care about whatever you do. It's true. They say, well, Jesus is gracious, Jesus is kind, Jesus will go ahead and forgive everything, so do whatever you want to do. The most important thing is just to feel forgiven, and then everything's good. Okay? That's what we get over and over and over again. I hear this all the time. What happened to the passages, be holy as I am holy? Is there not a call to the Christian to go ahead and to live a righteous life? Isn't it there? Don't we find it in Scripture? And yet false teachers come into the church and say, just do whatever you want to do. Just make sure that you feel good about it, and so therefore it's all fine. I hear it all the time. We find it here in Christian music. We hear it in, in teaching all over the place. We hear it at conferences. It's almost as if guilt in, of any sense whatsoever, the feeling bad about sin, is, is that's the worst thing that you could possibly do. Yet I go back to the words of Jesus, and he talks about being poor in spirit. He talks about those who were mourn. And the people who are mourned are the ones that are comforted. It's not the ones, they're not comforted just because they feel better, but there's actual mourning beforehand. If we're living in a life of sin, there's an issue there. We need to be mourning over that. And yet you have these, these false teachers coming in here and, and teaching soft doctrines, and certainly not the scriptures. So they've come in here, and by their teaching and by their actions, what they are doing here is that they are teaching a denial of Christ and his lordship. These people look good. Listen, if I had scheduled a, a guest speaker, and the guest speaker came in, and he had two horns popping out of his head, a forked tail, a pitchfork, had breath of, of brimstone and fire, um, and he came up here, and he began to speak. Number one, you'd say, Pastor, I think we need to replace you because you're getting the wrong guy in the pulpit, right? All right? But number two, you would say, well, I'm not listening to that guy, right? Right? Okay, I'll give him this to make sure. Because otherwise we have other issues. We've got we to gotta, we gotta double down on a few things. Right, and you look at that and say, whoa, that's that, what, what is that? Okay? Because you say that's obviously not what it's supposed to, supposed to be happening. But here's the problem is that the false teachers have crept in unnoticed. They've snuck their way in. If you were going to tr- drink a glass of water out of the stream and you could actually see the parasites swimming and they're this big, you wouldn't go ahead and say, well, I'm going to guzzle that baby down. You say, of course not. You're going to weed it out. Okay? We oftentimes are deceived because we are thinking, we have a misperception that it looks clean and it is not. And we have to take the things which we are hearing from the broader community and also as, as people are teaching us and put it through the filter of the word and say, is that true? 
okay? So, ladies and gentlemen, if you do not have a good understanding of Scripture, you may very well have a leaky filter and you're not doing an adequate job. Know the Word of God. This is what keeps you safe, okay? Paul will write about this, and he says, when Paul was dealing with people, the so-called super apostles in 2 Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians, uh, people were coming in, and they were teachers, or trying to be teachers, and trying to subvert Paul. And Paul writes this. He says, what am I, <clears throat> and what I am doing, I will continue to do in order to undermine the claim of those who would like to claim that in their boasted mission, that they work on the same terms as we do. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. They're fakes. He continues on. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light, so it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. You've got to filter things through the, through the lens of Scripture or through the filter of Scripture, or you will be deceived. And this is happening in the first century. In the first century, you have people who are coming in as religious carpetbaggers, people coming in profiteering off the language of religiosity and not a relationship and a true relationship with Jesus Christ. So, he now comes and he's going to give us biblical examples. And surprise, surprise, he's going to give us three of them. Okay? So let me read the three, and then we'll come back to explain them. Now, I want to remind you, although you once fully knew that Jesus, who saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterwards destroyed those who did not believe. Example one. Example two. And the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Example two. Example three. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desires, or unnatural desire, serve as an example for undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. Number three. One, two, and three, what we have here. Now, we look, first of all, we look at the first group, which is the uh, children of Israel as they've come out, and they're in the Exodus. And the, you've got these people who have come out of, out, out of Egypt, people who are groaning to God and saying, where is God of the promises? We'd like him to come and save us. And God sends the deliverer, and Moses comes. And Moses, the deliverer, comes, and he confronts Pharaoh, and he says, let my people go. And Pharaoh says, who is Yahweh, that I should listen to him? And God says, let me answer that question. And God answers that question with 10 different plagues, resulting ultimately in the death of the firstborn son, even of Pharaoh himself. And the children of Israel are led out of Egypt, and they come to the, come to the Red Sea, and they're like, they're like, oh, what are we going to do now? And yet God opens up the sea, and they walk through on dry land. And the Egyptians follow afterwards, and the waters collapse upon them, and they are destroyed. I would like to think. I would like to think that would have got my attention if I was an Israelite. Don't you? It's almost as if as soon as they got on the other side, they begin to grumble. Yeah, but we're thirsty. Yeah, but we're hungry. Yeah, but wasn't it better to go back into Egypt because they've got leeks and garlics and stuff? Okay. They've got all kinds of good stuff. Maybe, maybe we should go back. Are you kidding me? But that's, that's what they want. And God, slowly but surely, begins to wipe them out. Okay? Remember that these are a people, when they come to the promised land, they say, we're not going into the promised land, so therefore God rejects them, at least a whole generation of them. These are a people who've decided to go back to Egypt. And God has to stop them. These are people who said, you know what? We're going to reject the priesthood of Aaron. And so therefore, God has to deal with them. These are people who claim over and over again, God has sent them into the wilderness to starve them and to thirst them to death. This is a people who have said, uh, the armies are too big, so we are not going to, we are not going to uh, fight them. This is a people who said, you know what? Let's make uh, our own God, and we'll have Aaron form a calf that we might worship him and then involve ourselves in an orgy of, of immorality at the base of the mountain where the law of God was given. They knew the truth. They should have known the right things to do. They didn't do them. And God said, I will take out that whole generation. Our God is a God who is willing to judge. And anybody who reads scripture that says, oh, everything's fine, everything's fine, just don't feel guilty about it, 
is misleading you. God judges Israel. Look at the second one. We look here at the second one here. We see the angels, the angels who did not keep their own abode. And the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority but left their proper dwelling. Now, this one here, quite frankly, is a, is a, is a difficult one and has a history of interpretation which is hard for people. Um, as we look at this, uh, many people believe, including the apocryphal book of First Enoch, uh, s- believes that this is a commentary on Genesis chapter 6. And in Genesis chapter 6, if you remember that, that's the, the prelude to the, the great flood. Uh, we hear that the sons of God uh, began to interact with the sons of, or the daughters of men. And many people believe that the sons of God, that's a short term, or a, uh, a nickname, if you will, or a way of talking about the angels. And they think that, oh, the angels began to procreate with humans, and therefore had a special people called the Nephilim. Um, this is taught in the apocryphal book, First Enoch. That is what it says, okay? But that is not what is affirmed in the book of Jude. That's not what the book of Jude says, the book of Jude simply says that there was angels who did not keep their position of authority, and therefore they were judged for it, and that they are condemned until the end times. Obviously, it can't be all of the fallen angels, but it has to be some of them, okay? So as I look at this one here, I do not believe that this is speaking of Genesis chapter 6. I believe that this is talking about the fall of the angels, okay? I think that's what that's talking about, or at least some of them. And so, once again, our God is a God who will judge he will judge man, Israel when they come out of the land, when they act in immorality. He will judge angels. And then if we go to the third example, in Sodom and Gomorrah, even before we have the nation of Israel, just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire. And he says, well, God went ahead and he put a very severe punishment upon Sodom and Gomorrah. He did. And you'll remember the story out of the book of Genesis where God basically got Lot and family out of Sodom and Gomorrah and then rained down fire and sulfur upon these cities and wiped them out. And wiped them out. There's not a grease spot left of Sodom and Gomorrah. These are people, it says, that they were pursuing unnatural desire. The words here are heterosarchs, which is other flesh. This speaks to the idea of homosexual sin. That's what they're talking about here. It's that's what it was talking about in Genesis. It's confirmed here in the book of Jude. And it says they were doing things which they were not supposed to be doing, and God judged them for it. God is not a God who is afraid to judge, and God is a God who in the past has judged one, two, three times. And we could probably add a lot more to that, but Jude likes threes, right? So we see then, we see this call to filter your teachers because there's an awful lot of parasites among them. Filter your teachers, make sure that they're true teachers, that they're giving the true word, because some have snuck in, and you have to make sure that they're telling the truth. Understand that God has judged these false teachers in the past, and he will do so again. He then goes to describe the teachers yet again. Verse 8, yet in like manner, these people also, okay, so these people here, once again, are the false teachers. Yet in like manner, these people also, relying on their dreams, and we get a triad, defile the flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme the glorious ones. Once again, it's a three, uh, three thing. Now, I don't like the ESV's translation here, yet in like manner, these people also relying on their dreams. Uh, many of the translations simply say this, these dreamers do these three things. And I think that's simpler, and I think that gets to the point a lot easier. So what we have here is we have a threefold explanation of what these dreamers do, these people who rely upon perhaps emotionalism or perhaps something which is subjective, but certainly not the word of God. And these folks, they, what do they do? They defile the flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme the glorious ones. Well, these three things actually relate to the three things that we just saw. So when it talks about homosexual sin in verse 7, that is the idea of defiling the flesh, okay? It's right next to each other. They defile the flesh. So he's referring back to that example. If you go to the next one, it talks about rejecting authority. The rejecting authority is the example of the angels, where the angels basically rejected God's authority. And then when you get to the final one, we get here, blaspheme the glorious ones. The people of Israel, we could say that they blasphemed God and and all of his commandments by their practical heresy in the golden calf incident, for example. 
His example, though, of the, um, the defiling of the flesh, or excuse me, or the blasphemy of the glorious ones, he gives a further example, which is the story of Michael the archangel. So let's look at that briefly. Verse 9. But when the archangel Michael contending with the devil was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce blasphemous judgments, but he said, the Lord rebuke you. But these people blaspheme all that they do, <clears throat> all that they do not understand, and they are destroyed by all that they, excuse me, and they are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. Where do you find that at? Where is that in the Old Testament, where Michael, the angel, gets into a dispute with the devil. Can we find that anywhere? Anybody give me a chapter verse? No? I mean, we find Michael, but we don't find a dispute about the body of Moses. Once again, this is taken from, a stra- from an apocryphal book. Now, some people are like, apocryphal book? Why are we talking about the apocrypha? Have we turned into Catholics? No. But the, many of the books of the Apocrypha were well known for these people, and they're taking examples from books which they knew. If you go to the book of Titus, for example, the Apostle Paul will quote from a pagan philosopher and a pagan po- poet. You know, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. That quotation, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons, that's a quotation from a, from a, from a pagan poet, okay? So when they quote something, because it's under inspiration, this is true, but it doesn't mean that the whole book is true, okay? So when we look at this one here, this is probably taken, this account here is probably taken from uh, a, a, an apocryphal book called the Testament of Moses, okay? But when the archangel Michael contending with the devil was disputing about the body of Moses, he didn't presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, okay? He simply said that the Lord rebuke you. Now, that's in the apocryphal book, okay? That's all fine, okay? Because evidently, this is an accurate description of what happened, Fine. If we look at the section here and apply it to the teachers of the time around Jude, what's going on here? Why is this example given here? Well, it appears that these, once again, these religious teachers are coming in and they are talking about spiritual things, but they don't know what they're talking about. And in this example, we have Michael the archangel. He's, he's saying to, to Satan, when Satan says, hey, uh, we don't need to bury Moses' body because Moses was a murderer. He killed the Egyptian, okay? And Michael doesn't go ahead and get into an argument with him. Michael simply says, the Lord rebukes you. That's it. That's all that Michael does. Okay? Yet you get these, 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 these blowhards, you get these people out there who think they know so much about Satan and demons and this type of stuff, and they're saying all kinds of stuff and teaching all kinds of stuff which they don't know what they're talking about. And people are like blown away. They're like, wow, he knows so much. I said, church where I was interning. Our pastor, he was preaching a message, and he was giving an example of a false teaching, okay? And they began to go ahead, and he was giving this false teaching, you know, without telling people it was a false teaching. He was getting there. He's going to tell them that this was a false teaching, you know? But as they began to do this, there's a little old woman in the front, front pew, awesome Christian woman, awesome Christian woman. But there she was up in the front row, and she says, oh, that is so good. Oh, that is so good. But it was all heresy. What are you saying? And he says, no, no. Her name was Helen. He says, no, Helen. He says, I'm saying heresy. It's a false teaching. But sometimes when you get people up front and people talk about spiritual things and they speak about it with, with passion and, and dynamism, that people say, oh, that must be true. Or, oh, that person's got some sort of new teaching, and that must be really great. Filter through the word of God. I don't care what a person says with passion. I don't care what a person says with emotion. I care if the person's words accord with the scripture of God. Filter it. And if you aren't filtering it, you are up to infection. Know your word of God. Filter it. We live in perilous times, folks. Filter it. All right. Verse 11. I know this is a long section, so, uh, and there's lots of examples. Blame Jude. Okay. Woe to them. And what's Jude going to do? He's going to give three examples. Because that's what Jude does. This guy likes three. Woe to them. Woe to them, for they walked in the way of Cain and abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's heir. 
and perished in Korah's rebellion, one, two, and three. So they walked in the way of Cain. Let's take a look at that one here. When we look, what do you mean they walked in the way of Cain? Because the way of Cain, what do we know about Cain? Cain went and he killed his, his brother, okay? Older brother killed his younger brother, okay? It's always a bit ironic because in the book of Genesis, Cain says, am I my brother's keeper? With the full expectation that the answer is no, but the correct answer is, yes, you are. Am I my brother's keeper? Yes. Especially as the older brother, yeah, absolutely you're your, your, your brother's keeper. Okay? In, in the book of 1 John, uh, John will make a, a big contrast between be like Christ who gives himself and gives his life. He is a self-sacrificer as opposed to Cain who wanted for his own selfish pleasure God to accept his sacrifice. The way of Cain is a way of, of personal gain and of self-aggrandizement. Woe to them for they have walked in the way of Cain. And they have abandoned themselves for the sake of gain. Excuse me. And to Balaam's heir. So you say, what is, what is Balaam's heir? I thought Balaam wasn't that bad, right? Balaam's a kind of a, kind of a hard one because you have to sort of patch Balaam together. Okay? Remember the story of Balaam? Oh, some of you know. Okay. So the story of Balaam, we find the story of Balaam in, in Numbers chapters 22 through 25. And what we have here is we have, we have Balak, okay? Balak, the king of Midian. Midian or Moab? Midian. Midian? Anybody? Moab? Moab? Okay, okay. Balak. So we have King Balak. Okay, sorry about that. So Balak, we have Balak here, and Balak uh, hires Balaam. And he says, I want you to come over here because you're a prophet, and I want you to come, and I want you to curse Israel. And so he calls him to curse Israel, and uh, uh, no, I can't go. No, I can't go. No, I can't go. So finally, after three times, he tells, tells Balak that he can't go. He says, even if you offer me a full room of silver, I cannot go. I cannot cur curse Israel. He says, but you stay with me, and I'll see what God has to say. And uh, God says, oh, go ahead and go. And he starts to go, and as he goes, uh, God's like, you know, this guy, Balaam's guy's got a bad spirit. And all of a sudden, we have the whole situation where an angel shows up before Balaam's donkey, three different times, right? And Balaam's hitting the donkey. Finally, Balaam's, or, uh, the donkey speaks to Balaam. Now, do you remember the story? Okay. By the way, if an animal ever speaks to you, you are in trouble. It's true. It's true. I don't think there's any occasion in Scripture where if an animal speaks to you, you're, you're in good shape, okay? So we have the, the, the donkey he's speaking to him, but... but Balaam continues on, and God says, okay, do what you do, but uh, you cannot curse Israel. And so we have Balaam, and Balaam goes out, and he, he sees Israel encamped, and he gives, instead of a curse, he gives a blessing. And Balak, the king, is just furious, and then he goes to another location, and he blesses them instead of cursing them, and Balak is furious, and it happens a third time. And that's chapter 25, and the story's over. So we think, oh, Okay, Balaam turns out to be not too bad of a guy. Here's the deal. Go to Revelation chapter 2 and verse 14 and give you a little bit more on, on who Balaam is, okay? Like I said, you have to sort of piece Balaam together a little bit. But in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 14, he says, um, but I have a few things. Now, he's speaking to a, this is John's, um, or actually Jesus, Jesus uh, speaking to a church. Uh, John being the writer. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who are holding to the teachings of Balaam. Well, what is that? Who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food and sacrifice to idols and practice sexual immorality. See, when all said and done, Balaam, in, in chapters 22 through 25 of the book of Numbers, Balaam does not officially curse Israel. But we see that Balaam took a side job. And in that side job, he became an advisor to Balak that said, I can't curse them, but this is what you need to do. Send in the party girls, okay? Because men are stupid, okay? Well, it's true. Men are stupid, and they will follow their sexual desires. And in following their sexual desires, they'll marry these girls. They'll get themselves in idolatry. And if you want to screw up a nation, you screw them up sexually. It's true. So that's what he did. So this is Balaam's advice to him. Balaam, for a, Balaam for, who had the privilege of God t talking to him three different times, the man who had the privilege of 
had a donkey speak to him. That should get your attention. And yet he's still advised against. These religious teachers, they've gone the way of Cain, of selfishness. They've gone the way of Balaam, who are willing to sell out. And then lastly, we have uh, <clears throat> Balaam's heir and perished in Korah's rebellion. And of course, Korah's rebellion, we won't go through a lot of details there because we're not giving a whole lot of details. But in Korah's rebellion, of course, there was a, a deciding of, we're not going to follow Moses, we're not following Aaron, we're headed back. Okay. He finishes up now with not a triad. He finishes up with a twofold triad. Six things. And we get six things are said of these false teachers. In one respect, I believe that what this is, is that he's followed this form, triad, 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 and now he's going to say, okay, now I'll give you six things to make it very, very clear as to how bad these guys are. So look. These are hidden reefs at your love feasts. As they feast with you without fear, shepherds feeding themselves, waterless clouds swept along by winds, fruitless trees in late autumn twice dead, uprooted, wild waves of the sea casting up the foam of their own shame, wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. The first one here is a little difficult, okay? And different translations will have different things here. These are hidden reefs. Now, in most translations, they will at least, at the very minimum, they'll have a number next to it. And I'll say the word spots or blemishes. Or if your translation says spots or blemishes, it'll have a little number next to it. It'll say hidden reefs, okay? Because there's a question about what the actual word means here. It may have the idea of a reef, which is just underneath the water, and your ship hits it, and it makes you sink, which certainly fits the context here. But it could also mean the idea basically like they are bad apples within a barrel. It's spotted and moldy, and it's going to corrupt the rest. And that also would work in this particular context. I, I don't know if we can say with surety, because people argue back and forth as to what, what is there. But the intent is clear. These are people who, un, who, though you don't recognize it, are causing your demise. Okay? So, once again, watch out for them. These people who walk amongst you and feast among you and rub elbows with you and laugh it up. But they are dangerous. And they do so shamelessly. Second of all, they are shepherds feeding themselves. You know, if we were to go ahead and look at, I mean, what, is, what does the good shepherd do? What's the definition of the good shepherd? And the good shepherd lays his life down for his sheep. And yet these are people who are not laying their lives down for the sheep, but these are people who are eating the sheep. They're taking them, and they are not shearing them. They are skinning them. These are ones who are shepherds feeding themselves. These are waterless clouds swept along by winds. They look like hope. They look like the rain which need, is needed, needed for the planting and instead, what they are is they are a false front. They are a false front. They come along. They themselves are not rooted. They are completely useless. Fourth thing, they are fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead, uprooted. These are ones, once again, who give the appearance of looking good, but they don't give any fruit. They give nothing of, of, of nutrition. They are uprooted. They are dead. Fruit tree, I don't even know if you can even burn it for much, for much heat. Fifth thing, there are wild waves of the sea casting up foam of their own shame. A little difficult to understand what he means by this. Perhaps it has the idea of the, the foam of sort of a pollution, if you will, but it's a little difficult to say. Wandering stars. I like the wandering stars here in particular because if you are in the midst of a desert and you're trying to go from place A to B and you have no other discernible landmarks, you look to the stars and use the stars to navigate to where you're at. But if you were to, to, to navigate upon something that which is moving, all you're going to be is lost. And that's what these guys are. They're claiming to shine bright in spirituality, but the reality is that they're not attached to the truth. And he finishes up with this last summary statement. For whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. These are the false teachers who have come to deceive you. These are the ones for whom the millstone needs to be put upon their neck and they need to be thrown into the, into the pit. Listen. We live in a world today which has a real hard time with truth. 
People talk about my truth all of the time. No such thing. There's truth. And we have the truth of Scripture. And we need to be filtering things through the filter of Scripture. And if we're not, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are in big trouble. We have a society which wants to turn every sin into a legitimacy. Look at Isaiah chapter, well, I'll just read it for you for time's sake. Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 20. 700 years before Christ, Isaiah writes, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and shrewd in their own sight. If we live in a world which wants to confuse things back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, and it should not surprise us that we live in a world that is like that. But that should not be the case of the church of God. The church of God should understand what is truth, should teach truth, and should be unequivocal in this. We should not be confused by this. If we as the church abdicate the responsibility which God has given to us to hold on to the truth, there is no hope for this world. We have churches around us who put out all kinds of false teaching. You start the month of June and you have LGBTQ Pride Day. You have month, excuse me, and then in the Pierce County, you get it for another month, June and July. And we have churches around us who will go ahead and put up their flag saying, come on in. And those are people who desperately need Jesus Christ as their Savior. They don't need to be affirmed in their sin. We have to tell the truth. If you don't tell the truth, then what are you going to do? You're going to keep on calling evil good? You can't do that and function as the church. And yet we have leadership in multiple churches which are doing that, calling evil good, calling evil good. And why? Because they're acting as religious carpetbaggers who do not want their population to leave. Oh, stay with us. Stay with us. Keep on giving your tithe money. Forget your tithe money. Tell the truth. What this world needs. Is the church touched by the grace of Jesus Christ, understanding the salvation which is available in Jesus Christ, rejoicing the freedom of salvation, teaching its people the way that they're to walk according to Scripture, understanding that there's people who do not have that teaching, and reaching out to them and telling them that there is hope for them, and not telling them that evil is good. Sin is still sin, folks. It's still there. So beware of the parasites. Beware of those who will secretly infest you to your arm. Take the teaching that is there and put it under pressure and squeeze it through the filter. Weed out the parasites so that you might drink the fresh water and teach the fresh water. For there are many teachers who will deny their, pastor or deny their master for the sake of a couple of bucks. In Jude-like Jude -like style, hold the word, live the truth, agonize for the faith. The filter of God must be, must be known, must be taught, and must be used for the, vi for the vitality and for the health of the church of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen.